Joyce and I sat together one day sharing tears and coffee as Joyce told me about her mother's declining health. Her mother had Alzheimer's and Joyce and her siblings made the recent decision to move her mother into assisted living and another decision to sell their mother's home that had been in the family for quite some time. When Joyce and I spoke of her mother, things were going well, but when we started to talk about the house, it struck a chord. She started to cry, started to tell me about how that house held so many memories of their family sharing meals and laughter, heartbreak and uncertainty, a house where her parents helped raise grandchildren, helped guide those siblings, a house where they shared all of the major holidays and all the, of the many traditions that go along with time together and family. The sale of her house was a reminder that some things come to an end, that there's a season for everything, of the fragility of life. When I sat with her that day in so many meetings afterward, and in those conversations as we walked on the road to healing, as Joyce continued to grieve over the loss of that home, I learned something very important about the power of traditions and the power that traditions have in shaping the values that families often embody, shaping community, and informing us as to where we've come from, the importance of where we'd like to go as we pass traditions down to the next generation. As Joyce and I met over those many months, we talked about how some traditions were salvaged. Joyce was doing many things with her children and her grandchildren that her mother did with her. And other traditions had to be reimagined, shaped for a new day, and busy schedules. I learned about the power of the things that we do. For traditions are no mere rituals that we do just because we've always done them that way. They have the power to paint a picture, a living reminder of the values that build and sustain community. Reminders of the way we live out those things that make us who we are. In Paul's first letter to the churches in Corinth, Paul was trying to pass along the tradition that played an extremely important part in the early church going all the way back to Jesus. You remember Jesus' last week, he gathered his disciples to share in another tradition that was important to the Jewish people, Passover. You may recall that it was back in Exodus that God told the Israelites to remember where they came from. Enslavement in Egypt brought them out into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. God told them, share the Passover meal every year in order to remember where you came from, in order to remember how I redeemed you. And here in Jesus' last week of ministry, he gathered his disciples during that Passover meal and took a new, an old tradition, made it new, made it his own. Paul and the other Gospels agree resoundingly that it was during that meal that Jesus told them to continue that meal in remembrance of me. Now this was important for Paul and the Corinthian community. You may recall in your own Sunday school lessons, or perhaps in your own reading of the Bible as you read through 1 and 2 Corinthians, that Paul had quite a contentious relationship with those churches in Corinth. They were a church filled with disagreement and division and conflicts. I mean, sure, you know how it is. You've got a bunch of people coming from all walks of life, people with different ideas and views and different theologies all coming together. There's going to be a fight or two. Paul notes in chapter 11 that scripture lesson Claude read, uh, read today, that when they gathered at meal, there was fighting. There were, the meetings were contentious. They had conflicts over the dinner table. And even this meal, the sacred tradition that Jesus passed down to them was something of contention. The wealthy were keeping the poor marginalized. Some people had to sit there. Others people had to sit there. The leaders were bullying those that we're having a hard time in community. And so when Paul passes this tradition on to them of this common meal, he said of all the traditions in church, this is the one that reminds us that we are a united body of believers. I appeal to you, he wrote, that you all be in agreement of 
the same mind. And I pass along to you what Jesus has passed along to me, that you should do this in remembrance of him. So Paul stresses this tradition and the values that it embodied. He made sure that when, when it came to sharing in this meal, yes, disagreements may abound, but when it came to sharing in this common meal, this Lord's Supper, that everyone had a place at the table, that no one was being left out, that everyone was to be included and not excluded. He talked about how this tradition gives us a picture of that kind of ministry, of the kind of ministry that shares the type of community that Jesus Christ wanted to shape. He says, for instance, that this meal is a reminder, of course, of Christ's body and blood, the bread broken for us, the juice that we take, a symbol of Christ's blood shed for all of us. It also symbolizes the gathering of the church. Jesus said that this cup is the new covenant of my blood, a covenant being a promise between God and God's people, a pact or an agreement that all would come together and share in that common holiness and symbol of unity that God had set out to establish, and that this meal would embody and enshrine hope for the future. Do this as often as you gather together, remembering that Jesus will come again. A hope and a promise that Jesus will one day gather all of God's people together for that great banquet feast that Isaiah envisioned so long ago in Isaiah 25, when it says that God will gather everyone from the east and the west and the north and the south, four corners of the earth, that all may have a place at table. Now that's the kind of picture that's the kind of living reminder I think communion still provides for us today. As we gather at table, we note that all who call Christ Lord are welcome to the table, that no one should be left out, that all have an equal place at table as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's all in the family. And yes, we are a family. Aren't we? Now, I grew up in a large Italian family. I'm, I'm proud to say that some of my uh, family is here today. My mom's here. Uh, if you don't know who she is, just look for the lady who looks just like Haley, and that's her. We call Haley Little Fran. My in laws, my cousins, and uncle are out. Uh, they came to the first service. They'll be here tonight. The LaGuardias are taking over. Watch out. Everyone run for the hills. <laughs> now, I grew up in a large Italian family. One of the traditions that we cherished was having dinner every Sunday at my grandpa's house over in Brooklyn. We used to get, it was a shotgun house, so we used to fill up the house, very small house. We used to sit out on the patio. Grandpa used to grill. Don't touch his grill. That's grandpa's grill. And every week he used to burn the chicken and the Italian sausage and make his gravy that, it's gravy by the way for Italians, it's not sauce, it's gravy. That he always said that he threw some benzene oil in there and all kinds of things. And you know, we were wondering, why, why haven't you heard about all this E. coli outbreak back in the day? I never heard about E. coli until recently with the chicken. It's because Grandpa always burned the chicken. You never had to worry about E. coli. But it was there in that upbringing, around that sacred table for me, that I learned that no matter where you came from, no matter what kind of things you did, no matter how you stumbled along or how much you disagreed, no matter what kind of stupid thing you said every now and then, that you were always welcome back to the table. You always had a place at Grandpa's table. Now that sounds like church to me, doesn't it? And it sounds like a good tradition to follow. A tradition that I think fits right in the midst of so many traditions and the mission that unites us as a church here today. Think about our mission as a church. Have you taken a look at the mission recently? I mean, have you read it, really thought about it, really prayed about it? When you look at the mission, that word worship shows up all over the place. And of course, worship includes not only this tradition of communion, but so many traditions that we value here as, at First Baptist Church. Let me read the mission for you, just to remind you of the power that this mission statement has for us, the unifying power it has for us, but also of the importance of tradition that we have in this place. 
The mission of First Baptist Church of Vero Beach is the worship of God. In obedience to Him, worship includes reaching out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, equipping our members for discipleship, and demonstrating Christ's love through ministry and fellowship. Worship. Discipleship. Outreach. Fellowship. All of the values that not only we cherish, but all of the values that we can sum up in this common meal today as we gather again as a united people. You know, as I, as I sat with Joyce that day, talking about her mom and her mom's home, I noted the grieving process that went along with losing something. She was afraid that with the, path, with, that with the selling of the home that those traditions would die. We found that not to be the case. But she was afraid of losing something that she couldn't share with her children, or her grandchildren, or her great-grandchildren, those traditions that she held dear. Got me thinking about church. You know, we need to pass along the traditions of our church to teach our traditions so that when our children and those young people who are in our pews grow, grow and raise their children, that they will know who we are, where we've come from, where God is taking us with that mission, it got me thinking, what would be lost if there was no First Baptist Church? What traditions would be missing in this community? Who would be there for the homeless people on Wednesday night, or for those youth that gather on Wednesday night? Who would be there to help young people on Thursday night hear the gospel as they play basketball in our gym? How would we grow in Christ without the Sunday school classes and the GROW ministry and the programs that we hold dear, what would be missing? And what would, happen, what would happen if we gathered at this table and we didn't take Paul's advice in remembering why we gather here in the first place? As a body of believers who come from all different backgrounds, who come together in all of its diversity and make up that family of faith as quirky as it may be sometimes, that God has found in His First Baptist Church of Vero Beach. A place in which all people are welcome here at this table and all have a place to come and to enjoy the tradition that goes as far back as Jesus, who reminded us of what unites all of us, His death, His resurrection, and the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus who comes to us yet again today and reminds us that we are redeemed people who have a purpose and a mission in this community, in this place. You know, one of my friends once said that we are one generation from losing the tradition and losing who we are as a church. Not just this church, many churches. It is important for us not only to teach the traditions of the church, to teach the teachings of Jesus Christ, to pass along the values that are important to us, but to live out the traditions, the values that they embody, as a church that welcomes us yet again to Christ's table. I hope that this table is meaningful to you as it is to me. Perhaps you might think of the time you've spent with your family, doing traditions, passing along the values that are important to you, perhaps gathering it the table at your grandma or grandpa's house or wherever you gather. This kind of table is not only a reminder of the kind of traditions that shape us as a community, but the very faith that we live out by participating in a tradition that reminds us of the risen Lord who comes to us yet again and saves us over and over again that we might share that good news with us. Let us pray together. Lord, you invite us back to table this morning. It is but one tradition of many that connects us to you, that connects us to God, that connects us to each other. That as we gather as a family of faith, brothers and sisters, in the name of your Son, we are reminded of our common purpose of living out a mission of being the presence of Christ in this community 
of representing Christ in our families and in our workplaces and in our neighborhoods, of coming together as a people who value not only this tradition, but the worship that we live out in obedience to you, in sharing the gospel, in becoming stronger disciples, and going out to invite others to this table. For we are a people, Lord, that you have called into being so long ago, that have values, that cherish traditions, that we live out, especially in this time of sharing in this common meal, the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we move into our time of communion, I'm going to ask that our deacons come forward. And our staff. I'd like to remind you that here.